While entrepreneurs are often lauded with creating new businesses and ideas, it is more often the case that change agents working within organizations or intrapreneurs are responsible for innovation and seeing those new ideas through to completion. Welcome to the Innovation Economy Entrepreneurs Series. I am your co-host, Adam Chen, an independent change management consultant and current president of AmenityLink, a property technology company. In this series, you will hear stories and insights from leaders within organizations that have had the courage to create new ways to move business forward. To listen to the latest episodes or sign up for the Innovation Economy newsletter, go to innovationeconomy.show or click on your favorite podcast app to make sure you hear the latest episodes. And now on to the show. Today, I'm very excited to have my guest, Roger Thompson, who's a former public company executive and a former colleague of mine in a couple circles. So Roger, welcome to the show. And I, I wonder if you could start by introducing yourself and just telling our listeners a little bit about your journey. Awesome. Thanks so much, Adam. It's great to be on the show. Great to see you again and have this opportunity. You know, very briefly, I'll just share. I'm based in Toronto, Canada first born Canadian in my family from immigrant parents from the Caribbean, studied finance and economics in a, you know, with a couple of different degrees, currently a student once again, exploring or, or hoping to complete my doc, doctorate degree in business where I'm hoping to focus on leadership, concepts and principles. But really, in terms of a career side, I started off in finance uh, with IBM. And then I went into some of my own entrepreneurial ventures, grad school, and then ended up at First Service Corporation, where I've been, where I was for the past 16 years up until just a couple of months ago. So now I'm pivoting in terms of the next chapter of my career, and uh, it's all an evolving process at this time. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Roger. Well, let's dive right in. I, uh, we're obviously here to talk about entrepreneurship, and I'm, I'm very curious to hear your perspective, you know, having been a former entrepreneur, having worked, um, and I firsthand have seen the experience of you facilitating uh, within First Service Corporation, but I'm curious how you might define the word entrepreneur and what that means uh, to you. Yeah, no, that's a great question, Adam. And, and to be truthful, I typically haven't used that term b- before. I've heard it, but I've never really used it as part of my lexicon. And the way that I think about intrapreneurship is current existing employees innovating within an existing company, as opposed to an entrepreneur who is starting something new on their own and bears all the risk. So it's really current employees innovating within an existing company is the way that I I think about it. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think those two concepts of entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship are mutually exclusive? Obviously, they have different contexts, as, as you kind of alluded to with risk, but, but you know, maybe tell me a little bit more about how you see the similarities and maybe the differences between the two. Yeah, great question. So if we think about uh, entrepreneurship, the entrepreneur, the owner, the founder, you know, however we describe this individual, they would bear all the risk. And of course, all of the rewards. I actually saw an interview recently by Elon Musk. And and now he's speaking, of course, as an entrepreneur, you know, many successful, well-known multinational companies. And, uh, And he described entrepreneurship as a very lonely job, uh, especially when you are the entrepreneur at the top. And he described this one thing, which I wanted to share, which is that you get the, you have to handle all the worst of the problems Hmm. because you are the last line of defense. So if I use that as one analogy, we go to the corporate side. Now we're within an existing company as an intrapreneur, you don't hold that same role. You can be a change agent in terms of your ideas, how you rally support, how you rally resources. But when there are issues, it may or may not stop with you. You will have others within the organization, perhaps more senior than you, that will handle those issues that typically a CEO would, uh, or an entrepreneur, I should say, would handle. Now, of course, conversely, the downside would be in terms of reaping the rewards. 
an entrepreneur will reap the full reward depending on their structure and how they're set up as opposed to an intrapreneur where that gets a little more diluted given that you're within an existing organization. So to kind of summarize this idea, I, I really think about support, resources, and perhaps you could think about the pressure. There's mm-hmm. truly a pressure differential between being an entrepreneur and an intrapreneur. Sure. So let's dig into entrepreneur a little bit mm-hmm. more. Certainly not every employee, um, I would say, would either self-describe themselves as an entrepreneur or, or be defined as such. But are, are there any intrinsic traits that you think uh, an entrepreneur has or, or that kind of you know comes to life, I guess, within these organizations? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I haven't done, you know, now that I'm a, a, a management researcher trying to be, I'm very careful with my words. And I will say this is my opinion only, not based on fact or scientific research. I think one of the key difference or one of the key kind of attributes of an entrepreneur is just their mindset, uh, which I think we're going to talk about a little bit more. You know, there are folks who show up to work to get a paycheck and do their job, and they may do that job very well. And that's very valuable, very important to the organization. But there are others who show up, want to do their job, but always see other opportunities, whether it's within their job or within their team or their department, their division, the entire company. And they're always have their eyes open to these possibilities. So perhaps one thing to think about is that mindset of the individual. And I'm going to make a guess that that translates to their personal life as well. We have Mm -hmm. folks who have habits, you know, and they just go through the motions and they could be very happy doing that. You know, I'm sure there's a lot, a lot of cultures, you know, we know Sunday's football day. This is how the day's going to look. We're going to tailgate. We're going to go here. We're going to do this. And this is what's going to happen during football season. For others, although they might indulge in that and enjoy it, that might not be the standard everyday routine. They're always looking for newer things. They're willing to try, even if it's not going to work. Um, But there's always on this lookout for betterment of either themselves or those around them. Yeah, yeah. Well, you you, you mentioned it. So I think that's a natural segue here about mindsets. Mm -hmm. So... You're an author. I, I, I subscribe to your uh, Roger Reed's newsletter, um, which I think provides some, some interesting insights and, and certainly expands my, you know, my breadth of knowledge. But going back to mindsets, I'm very familiar with Carol Dweck's work, Fixed Mindset, Growth Mindset. I think many of our listeners have probably um, mm-hmm. you know, heard that concept before. But you introduced uh, in, a, in a recent post kind of a, a new way of looking at mindset. And yeah. I might pose a question to you and then maybe you could explain to our listeners a little bit about uh, you know the research behind that and, and kind of your takeaways. So Roger, do you generally think that people are trying their best? <laughs> it's a great question. And I'm gonna be truthful and say I don't. Uh, <laughs> I want to believe that and I'm trying to pre rewire myself to perhaps believe that because perhaps my bias that there are certain individuals that I don't believe try their best completely distorts the way that I interact with them, I think about them, I approach them. And perhaps that's unfair because maybe, you know, perhaps my bias towards those individuals is just wrong, right? So um, that would be my kind of initial admission. Now, you know, I shared in the in the post that you're referring to that, you know, recently I've had some intera- uh, interactions with different folks. And I've noticed that I had that thought. And I said, well, wait a minute, maybe they are trying their best. How would I approach this differently? How do-? And it's crazy what I found personally, how differently I approach those situations. And it could be something as simple as being in line at the grocery store, where there's that frustrated customer who's in line ahead of you, and, you know, they're kind of mumbling and they're being grumpy to the, the the cashier. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, why are they being so miserable? Why couldn't they be nice? And I think to myself, wait a minute, maybe they're trying their best. Maybe they've had a really, really bad day. And they're just being human at this moment, although it's not the appropriate thing to do in society. And maybe all we needed to do is say to that individual, say, you know, it sounds like you're having a rough day. You know, I hope it turns out better. And that's the thing that I said to this individual. And he looked at me and he said, actually, I am having a rough day. And you know what? And he even said, he's like, you know what, ma'am, I shouldn't have acted the way I did. I got a lot going on. 
I'm really sorry. That would never have happened if I didn't think about that individual in a different light. And this is just one small example, of course, right? But if we think about it at home or at work, you can imagine how that might fly uh, to different scenarios. Yeah. So in, in that story, I, I certainly think that's a, a growth mindset in, in Carol Dweck's language mm -hmm. of you're, you're open to the idea that other people might be having a bad day or you're just open to, to having that empathy or whatever the case is. But uh, this book that, that, that you're kind of opining on, it's uh, Brian uh, Gottfriedson yep. Yep. about success mindsets. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could share a little bit about your viewpoint about you know, how does he take this concept of mindsets kind of one step further? Or, you know, what does a success mindset look like? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I'm, and apologies to, uh, to Professor Godfordson, I will not do your book justice in a very short <laughs> podcast on this question. But I think it goes back to the old analogy, and maybe I'll age myself here, G.I. Joe, knowing is half the battle, really understanding your default mindset is really mm -hmm. the starting place. Um, and in the book, he refers to a mindset assessment in which you can take, you know, online, I think it's through his not I think it's definitely through his website. And it has a series of a B questions that you go through and it gives you an assessment of yourself. Now, most of us, probably if asked would say we have a growth mindset, right? Because that's what we think is the right thing to say. And maybe we think that we're very open minded and etc. Um, but when you take the assessment, you recognize, oh, wait a minute, no, there's some, there's some areas that perhaps I don't. I mean, that's why I was vulnerable now enough to share with you earlier that, you know what, mm, I like to think that I wish I could say that, but I'm not sure if that's the case all the time. So I think my biggest takeaway that I want to share from that book is understanding where your default mindset is. And if you can know that, then you can learn some different strategies to overcome them if in fact you do want to be more growth minded remember not all people necessarily want that uh, another assumption we might make because uh, one is not necessarily better than the other they're just different states of being for different situations so that's that's i would say that would be the starting place is know your default yeah well that's great so these are some internal concepts right that we can um you know wrestle with or, or kind of learn to to kind of grow within, but there's also some external pressures that enable entrepreneurship to thrive. So let's take, for example, you know, I, I've kind of cleared some internal blockers and I'm approaching, I know my default mindset. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, I'm at least aware of some of my inherent bias, <laughs> right? Um, knowing is half the battle, as you said, but you've worked in large corporate environments. So what are some of the kind of external factors now that an organization can either do to enable folks to thrive, to innovate, to become entrepreneurs, to take some ownership? And maybe what are some of the pitfalls that you've witnessed that prevent that from happening? No, it's a great question. And I'm, I'm going to lead with essentially culture. And when I say culture, I mean a subset of culture in which ideas are received and handled. Uh, if we think about a simple context that we've all perhaps been in, uh, which is a meeting, and you know, you have to frame this meeting, you know, uh, maybe it started five minutes late, we have other personal deadlines that are going on, we have other pressures at home. But for this 45 minute to 60 minute meeting, we're here to brainstorm new ideas, perhaps. The question is, how do we handle that brainstorming activity? And how do we handle new ideas. Most of us have a default. If we hear something that doesn't jive with what we think, automatically it's dismissed. And it's truly a default for most of us. That would be a bias or, you know, kind of some of these mental roadblocks that we have. So as an organization, if we know that the, this is going to happen, whether it's purposefully or not, how do we design the manner in which we, A, create new ideas, you know, generate or create new ideas and evaluate ideas. And I think it's the evaluation stage where we can really learn a lot in terms of, I mean, let's think about it. When we have a new idea, I mean, there, perhaps there's some data and facts and experience to support it, or maybe there's not. So how does one justify that an idea is a good one or not? And what is the criteria in which we measure ideas and also being very aware of who 
is generating the idea. Because we also have a default of looking at individuals who've had positive past experience with ideas, and we overweight their new ideas, assuming that past success is a prediction of future. So there's all these nuances that go on within an organization and within this context of this brainstorming meeting, which I've framed. And I think it's around design where we can really improve the manner in which we create not only a process, but a culture of idea generation and idea evaluation. And I have lots of thoughts on that. I mean, maybe that's for another podcast around design and meetings and whatnot, but that would just be kind of one micro example of of how I think that a a company can really support uh, entrepreneurial kind of idea generation. I want to make sure you know about the other podcast from the Agile brand, the award-winning show about marketing strategy, technology, and the customer experience and building the brand of the future. It's called the Agile brand with Greg Kilstrom. And in it, we talk with leaders at some of the world's top brands, the MarTech platforms that are leading the way and other thought leaders in marketing, CX and digital transformation. Now in its fifth year with over 400 episodes and 1 million downloads, make sure you check it out with new episodes, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. To listen to the Agile Brand with Greg Kilstrom podcast, you can find it wherever you listen to podcasts, or you can go to theagilebrand.show. That's theagilebrand.show. Now let's get back to the show. So I've, I see this design area that you're speaking about and, and kind of, I guess, creating an environment, um, right? Some rules of engagement, maybe yep. that kind of play into some of that stuff, right? And that, that that's really exciting. On the, on the other hand, it also takes a, a strong leader to create that environment or, or to take that first step in, in trying to brainstorm. Yes. So what are some of those intrinsic traits of like strong leaders that you've seen or, or have interfaced with in your career that, that take that step, that do that? You know, is there anything special about leadership? And I know this is certainly an area of study for you. I'm really curious your view on leadership in general. Yes. So many layers to that question. If we stick to the example of how a leader would perhaps facilitate a discussion like this and what are some of the positive attributes, you know, I I think about a leader or facilitator, whoever's really managing this process, asking follow-up questions. Hmm. Sounds like such a simple thing. A general rule of thumb I have, especially with a new idea, is to when you ask a follow-up question, it's not just one. You need to go either two or three levels deep. So if someone has an idea to create a new product, okay, why do you think that product would be a valuable addition to our our portfolio? They answer the question. Well, that's really interesting. And you mentioned you want to focus on this particular segment. Like, why did you choose that segment? And you keep going deeper and deeper and deeper to kind of uncover the thinking behind the thinking. Hmm. Because most of us, including myself, can't articulate our thoughts succinctly and clearly in the moment. I'm sure we've heard the story of, it's not a story, it's kind of a a truth I've heard uh, at Amazon, right, where there's no PowerPoint slides. Hmm. It's forbidden. (laughs) I don't know if you've heard that, Adam, before, Mm -hmm. right? And they do the internal memo. And, you know, one of the reasons they do the internal memo is to force the individual who's sharing new information or, or, or a business proposal or an idea is to be able to articulate it in, in, a, in a story, in a verbatim way, as opposed to bullet points, which is a very different skill set. So, you know, before I go down that rabbit hole of, of, of Amazon and all the really interesting things they do around meetings, I'll go back to the main question, which is around leaders and leaders really asking follow-up questions and digging deeper to understand further and also challenge with positive intent the employee or individual who created the idea to have the, force them to think more deeply about it. Right. Yeah. So that's kind of one, one tactic that I think is really a powerful and some leaders do that very well. I think your sure. listeners can probably think right now that leader who shoots down an idea very quickly versus that one mm-hmm. that says, Oh, that's interesting. Tell me more. It's almost, it, it reminds me of the whole design thinking concept of um, divergent and convergent thinking, yes. right? And it's, it each has a time and a place, you know, and you want to, certainly I think a lot of folks would 
generally, I would say, even be reluctant to share new ideas. So it's the yep. load, leader's responsibility to, in the divergent thinking mode, to to ask the questions with positive intent, as you said. I love that word, positive intent, because it's it's yes and mm -hmm. what else, not yes but, because the but is what shuts people down. And yes. I think people, especially young professionals, maybe are naturally you know, fearful or maybe resistant to putting themselves out there. So it is the leader's responsibility to make sure that you feel comfortable enough to continue to share. Exactly. And, you know, I'll, I'll share one other point, if, if I may, Adam, you know, yeah. the scientific method, you know, is an under, under an, an area that non scientists don't really understand. But the scientific method is really about a key attribute, which is, can this idea be proven false. So instead of can it be proven true, it is true because A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Okay, great. But can it be disproved? What we call the counterfactual. So in a business context, I think a really strong application of that is someone has an idea. You've gone down the path of asking many questions. Other members have said, oh, wow, that's great. You start to get groupthink problems happening here confirmation bias coming in, saliency, all these other kind of cognitive things go crazy with this shiny new idea. And a, le a really strong leader can ask the question, say, under what conditions would this be a bad idea? <laughs> oh, like that. let me think about that for a moment. Well, if A, if B, okay. And then you start going down that path and the swell of excitement comes back down to reality which is usually the place we operate in the real world, right? When things really, you know, when um, the rubber meets the road, as we say, it's kind of the, you know, realist side of the pragmatic side of like what's really going to happen. So I think, you know, going back to the example of the leader asking the, the, the multi-level questions with positive intent, also making sure that we do the counter. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, and that one question I just described is a strong one. There are many others that that complement it, but that one usually gets gets people thinking a little differently. Yeah, I like that. And it is the leader's responsibility to 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 get people to think differently and and ask those probing questions and do that. So yes, I'm curious in your experience or your your uh, you know opinions. When you're building like a high performing team and you're trying to you know construct this brainstorming team, maybe in, in your previous example. Is there a right mix of employees, skills, even size of team that are more conducive to, to getting the best out of this conversation? Good question. Good question. And, um, you know, I've been thinking about that idea a lot. I don't have the one answer. I think that's the, you know, kind of the goal of organizational organizations to figure this answer out, Adam. So that's I don't right. know if you and I can solve it here, but at least I have some thoughts I can share. It depends. Sorry, it starts with that. But I've been a big fan, and I have been for many years of what we call what I call pre work. Right? So if there was a brainstorming session, it sounds like we're really using this example. Does the brainstorming actually have to happen in that moment? I'm not so sure. Hmm. I think we can actually expand the manner in which we either test new ideas or generate new ideas, in very creative ways using technology even. I'll use a simple example. We could use a survey. You know, maybe there are 50 other people who we think their ideas or their contribution would be valuable, but we're not gonna have 50 people in the meeting. That's too much. Unless it was a well-designed meeting where you had small groups, so I shouldn't say no, but we could ask, 50 people one question and ask for their comments and their opinions, and then take that information, categorize it, theme it, and use it as an input for our idea generation session. Now, in that actual physical session, obviously, depending on how long we have, how much time we've allocated, what we're hoping to accomplish, we'll all come back to design in terms of uh, size. Once we get it, you know, my experience, once you get above 10 people, one leader slash facilitator, it can be problematic. You know, you start getting a 20, 30, 40. You can still do it if designed well, and there are multiple people taking on facilitative roles. 
right? Which I think we may have all experienced. You know, you go to a table, you get asked a question, you work that question, then you come back to the group, you share those ideas. Like that can that will work. So I don't think it's a one size fits all, Adam. I think it's really around design and also whether it's asynchronous or synchronous, right? Because feedback can come in different forms. Pre, which I think is an underutilized area, of course, during, and then also post, right? Yeah. To pressure test, to even A, B test the way questions are asked, right? Can you imagine asking a group of, of people, why do you think this would be a great idea? To ask another group, why do you think this would be a bad idea? Another group, so A, B, C test here. What do you think we're missing with this idea? If you frame it in different ways, really fascinating what you get back. And my last point here, because I know I've been rambling a little bit, is, you know, there's a lot of science around how we maximize the kind of creativeness of individuals. And I'm no expert in this area, but I do know that the order in which we ask questions matter. So the, even those three examples that I provided, you know, what do we like about this idea? What don't we like? What could be improved? The order in which you ask them matter. So there's lots of little design elements that need to be considered to maximize the effectiveness of that process. Yeah. I think as I listen to respond to some of these questions, the, the word that kind of sticks out in my mind from the leadership perspective is intentionality. Yes. You have to do this design down to the, the order of the questions, to your point, with intention mm -hmm. and, and knowing that it's going to affect different outcomes. I also love your idea of the pre-work. And I think this is definitely something I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, borrow <laughs> and, and try to implement more exactly. in my own, you know, work, you know, but, but when I think about the mix of people, I think some of this is like the awareness of, the folks that you have um, on your team or that you might be, you know, corralling in this group. And certainly there's going to be people on a spectrum, but some people are going to be more extroverted, maybe more vocal in these live meetings. And then there are certainly more folks that I would say stereotypically are more introverted and, and have more resistance to overcome to speak up in those types of settings. So this idea of pre-work is, is almost an inclusive tactic yes, yes. to make sure that regardless of where you live on the spectrum, you have the same opportunity for your voice to be heard. And I think even communicating the intention of that does, goes a long way to making the team feel comfortable and productive. Absolutely. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll give a couple more examples just to really bring this point home in the environment of academia and teaching, right? Of course, you know, if you think about a lecture hall, you might have 40 to 400 students. How can you make that experience one that's worth their while to show up, especially in this day and age where literally information you can get anywhere. Someone could be in class recording your lecture, post it there with friends and sell it. Who knows? But the idea is how do you make that experience kind of inspirational that people want to show up? Uh, which is different than uh, work. You have to show it up. You're paid to show up. Hmm. Students truly do have a choice. And I think it really comes down, once again, to design and how you engage your audience. Depending on the side, you can take on different tactics. But we think about polling, live polling, right? Using things even like Kahoot. That works really well in a school context and I think is underutilized in a work context. You could think about having a meeting and you're brainstorming new ideas. Now, once again, remember the first person who says that first idea has already anchored everybody. So maybe that's not a good way to do it. Uh, if you're doing it live, maybe it's you ask the question, you say, okay, take out your mobile phone, you know, put in this code, give me your idea and people do it. And then it shows up on the screen and then you can have that. So those little tactics that we use in academia and school, which, you know, that's one of many, I think apply very well to the corporate business entrepreneur context as well. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to continue on this, 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 uh, teaching direction, I guess, sure. you know, obviously, you know, you were uh, very studious in your youth and, and, you know, co collected all the degrees <laughs> you moved into some very prestigious, you know, corporate roles and now you're kind of re-entering academia, both as a, as a doctoral candidate, but also as a teacher. 
So I'm curious, maybe if you just reflect back on your professional career, what are some of those tenants and lessons that you've learned in the corporate environment that you're now trying to impart on the next generation? Oh, oh, oh great question. Um, I'm going to correct one thing that you said in terms of studious in my youth, uh, the complete <laughs> opposite of that. Uh, I was into sports and, you know, volunteerism and things like of that nature, but school was not my priority. I'm lucky that I was in an era where you did not need high 80s to get into a university. If mm -hmm. so, trust me, I would not have, I, I eked my way in. And um, I'll never forget the first week of school when I showed up on campus, moved on, moved into residence, and people are talking about their grades. And I thought, oh boy, I don't belong here. <laughs> so for me, that was the point of, well, I'm going to have to work really hard to stay. So hmm. I had the upward tra trajectory, and I think many kind of work hard, maybe in high school, and then they go the other way. Um, mine has been a, a slow journey up, learning how to learn, just having that open mindset, which I think I have, although I'm, it's being tested if I really do or not. But my wisdom for, for, for others, I think, goes back to this idea of a growth mindset that we need to continuously learn. It does not stop. Hmm. And... Um, you know, learning is a very interesting concept as well, because we're inundated with information from all different sources. And um, honestly, just recently, I was having a conversation with a past colleague who were, you know, close on a professional on a personal level as well. And, and I share with her that, you know, I, I limit my social media time. Uh, I have blocks on my phone for how much social media time and it gives me that warning, you know, the 30 minutes is up. <laughs> for the day type of thing. And I need those tools because otherwise I get sucked into the trap of spending hours and hours. And really the point I'm trying to make is I think about information like we think about our diet, our food, and that we need to be very mindful of what we eat and what we read or listen to. The quality of it, the source and the motivation behind it. Because and I posted about this actually recently on LinkedIn that, uh, you know, I think that journalism has an even more important role in our society today than it ever did before. As much as we think the information that we're reading online is from a person, you know, we're learning more and more. It's not. Right? Bots play a role, things of that nature. So really, the, I think the main idea I want to share with you in terms of a takeaway is you need to continuously learn. Be open to new ideas, but also be aware of the information that you're consuming and be very, very careful about what, who and what you listen to and especially how you then use that information. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, certainly. I, I love some of the kind of discipline tactics you, you apply to yourself and, and, and certainly that's a difficult task uh, in the world today with, uh, with the uh, information overload. So, yes. well, Roger, I really want to thank you for coming on the show today. I think this is a very different lens than some of my previous conversations on this show and, and really gets at, you know, kind of the behavior um, behind some of this, but, but especially on, you know, the design of how you, you structure environments in which, you know, both entrepreneurship and new ideas can kind of come to fruition. So thank you for your insights. And really quickly, Roger, if, if our listeners want to keep up with what you're doing, how can they best find you? I think on LinkedIn, search within LinkedIn, Roger Mark Thompson. You Hopefully you'll find me. I do, as you mentioned before, currently publish a weekly kind of blog post around Roger's Reads, just kind of sharing insights from books that I'm reading. Uh, but there's definitely more to come in that area. A lot more things I'd like to share, kind of the best of what other people have figured out and translating into useful tools, tactics, techniques that, you know, everyday people can, can benefit from. So that's one of the things that I'd really like to do moving forward. That's great. And that's the, the purpose I think of this show too, is, is take some of these concepts and make it actionable for the folks out there listening. So again, thank you for coming on the show, Roger, best of luck with your doctoral thesis and, and the work there. And um, to our listeners until next time. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. Appreciate it. Thanks again for listening to the Innovation Economy podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to subscribe on your podcast channel of choice. 
and leave us a rating so that others can find the show more easily. You can access more episodes at www.innovationeconomy.show or on your podcast platform of choice. The Innovation Economy podcast was created by The Agile Brand. Be sure to check out the Agile Brand guide series of books, The Agile Brand podcast, and other resources for marketing, CX, and other enterprise leaders to manage change and transformation in their organizations. The Innovation Economy is proudly produced by Missing Link, a Latina-owned, strategy-driven, creatively-fueled production co-op. From ideation to creation, they craft human connections through intelligent, engaging, and informative content. Until next time, let's keep innovating.